All right, all right, y'all. Good morning. Welcome uh, back to church here on Sunday morning. It's good to see everybody. It's good to see y'all here and ready for worship, ready to worship together, worship Christ together on the first day of the week, right? We worship on Sunday because Christ rose again on the first day of the week. So every week we get to celebrate that truth. And everything about today is changed because Christ is alive, right? Everything's changed because Christ is alive in heavenly places, preparing for us a place, and we're excited for it. Uh, we're excited to go and worship uh, this morning, but we're excited also to worship in eternity. So uh, as we get ready, as we get started, a couple of things to keep in mind. Next week, we've got our maid service. So next Sunday evening at 5 p.m., we'll do our marriage conference. If you're married, please come out and join us. Uh, we're also going to Top Golf this Saturday if you signed up and registered for that. Uh, we'll leave here. Um, what time are we leaving here this Saturday, Miss Cynthia? 4.30, 4.45. So 4.30, 4.45, we'll leave here to head to Augusta to go to Top Golf this Saturday. Um, and again, if you're a married couple, sign up with us. Uh, we're excited for it. And the next Sunday evening will be our conference. Now, if you're not married, you are welcome to come out to our maid conference next Sunday evening, okay? We're just going to be talking about marriage, but that's in Scripture, right? And the truths in Scripture are, are well to be rehearsed with everybody. So as we do that, uh, be there, be sure to join us uh, as we're excited for that. Uh, we're also going to be starting uh, our registering and our uh, ordering of Easter lilies. So coming up in Easter, we're going to be selling some, I say selling, we're going to be ordering Easter lilies together uh, in memorial for someone, in memory of someone, or just to honor someone. So uh, you'll be able to do that, be able to order that soon on our church center app, and we'll be able to have them up here to decorate for our Easter service. And then right after Easter service, we'll be able to take those home uh, with ourselves to be able to make sure we keep everybody in memory and that legacy that they're leaving make sure it keeps going on so excited about those things coming up at this time i invite you to stand to your feet with us we're going to get ready to worship as we do i want to look at the book of hebrews uh i believe we're in chapter number five number six and the word of god is is, is worthy to be magnified the word of god is worthy to be honored and and spoken of this morning right because it's truth one thing I said as we were praying uh, for our rehearsal is I want to see God's truth be magnified this morning. I want to see God's truth get out there, right? Because Scripture is truth, and that truth is what allows us to worship God fully, right? And as we grow in our knowledge of God, we can grow in our worship of God. And so in the book of Hebrews, no, I'm sorry, I'm looking at James. I'm sorry, Miss Ella. James chapter 1, my bad. James chapter 1, verse 27 says this. Pure religion and undefiled before God and before the Father is this. So you want to know what good pure religion is? To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, right? In their affliction. It doesn't say do it when they get out of affliction. It doesn't say do it before, or during. It says do it during, right? It also means do it after. Do it before that happens. Go and visit them and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So what's the point here? The point is that as we worship God in, in our religion, right, that's all about building those relationships, not only with God, but with other people. We say here that we love God, we love others, and we what? Serve both, right? So to go and to visit them, to keep them in our prayers, to keep them in our, our thoughts, but do more than just that. Go and visit them. Go and talk with them. Be there for them. Be there for each other. And the greatest news is that God has already initiated that for us, right? God has already started that for us. He visited us. When we were in our affliction, when we were in our pain, in our suffering, God was there with and for us. And so this morning, as we praise God for that truth, let also, let's also let that move us to go and to seek others that we can love. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you this morning for everything that you've done for me. I thank you for the mercies that you have given me to wake up this morning, to be here in good health with good family, Lord. You've, you've blessed me and you've blessed so many other people in here in different ways. And I pray now that as we worship, we can worship to your truth and that that truth will, will, will edify us this morning, Lord. It'll change us. And I pray that your spirit uh, will have his way this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's worship. What love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy. 
mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more what riches of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost stood neath the debt we could never afford our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. All right, y'all can have a seat right where you are this morning. I thank y'all for worshiping with us. Thank y'all for being here uh, and, and singing, right? Praise unto God because His mercies are more. Any situation, any tribulation, um, as, as I pray, one of my prayers is that God will give me the grace that I need for that day, right? When the Bible says His mercies are new every morning, it means they're new for every situation that you're going to encounter. Because every day is different, right? When we come and we wake up, we know the day is different. We know that there's new struggles, new stuff that's, that's in our way, right? But God's mercies are there to give us enough grace and enough power to go through that. We do that with each other, right? We do that as a family, as a church. And I thank you all for worshiping with us. And this time we're going to go and we're going to talk a little bit about our offering. And, and this morning I wanted to mention a little bit about just, just my family, why, why we give, why we serve, why we do what we do. And I want to do that by taking you to Ephesians chapter number 3. I want you to hear what the, the Apostle Paul says. He's talking to the church and, and, and he's writing his letter. And in the middle of the letter he kind of stops and he says this. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul's telling the church, here's why I pray. Here's why I'm bowing my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ to pray. Next verse. And he says that he would grant you, being the church, right? I'm praying, I'm bowing my knees, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Out of the richness of who God is, he's granting us this, this mercy we talked about, right? The riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith right that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints with all of them from past time from right now to later on right with all the saints what is that breadth and length and depth and height that you may be able to comprehend that and that you may know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. So my family, my wife and I make a decision when we get paid that we're going to give. And, and I do that, number one, because it's, it's what God would have for me. But I do that so that the mission of our church can carry on. Namely, that you may have the knowledge of Christ and that the fullness of God may dwell with you. With, with the people that are here, with the people that are coming here, with the people that will be here, right? That's why God has called me to do that. That's why he's called you. Each family, 
that's, that's given, that's represented here. Y'all are given faithfully, and God is doing great things with that. Um, I, I teach Stepping Forwards on Wednesday night. If you're a, a new family to the church, if you want to know more about the church, join us 645 on Wednesdays. And I love doing that because I get to see families from all different backgrounds, all different types of people, right? We're, we're all different. I know that. Marriage, we know that. We're different people trying to, trying to be one, right? But I get to see that, and I get to see the love of Christ dwell with people through how we learn and how we go through the Bible, the Word of God together. And so that's why I give. That's why I pray. That's why I'm here. That's why I do what I do. And I know it's the same as true for y'all. Each and every person that serves in this church does it so that we can see the glory of God dwell with others, right? So if you want to give, if you want to participate uh, and contribute, I guess, monetarily, you can do this with our website. Go to BBC Bethany or BethanyBBC.com. Set up reoccurring giving there. It's really easy. Same thing for our church center app. You can scan our QR codes. Um, if you're a person who likes cash or check, you can give in these envelopes and drop it out in one of these boxes here in the front or in the back. And Brother Larry will be right here by the door uh, as we leave for our overflow offering. So we thank y'all for giving above and beyond what God, what God calls us to do. And it's because of that we can support our evangelism. We had a broadcast yesterday to pray for people. We've got prayer requests. We're seeing the community be served through prayer. Your support and benevolence, our families that, that, that go through tough times get supported with food when stuff happens, when, when life happens. And we're seeing that happen with missions, with Brother Travis over with Unsheltered International and Brother Pat in Garden City and Augusta. So it works. It works. Giving works. And God blesses it. So let's pray. Let's ask God to continue to bless the efforts that he's called us to. And let's ask God to bless uh, the rest of the service. So Father, in Jesus' name. I do pray and ask uh, that your hand will be on the, the giving, the offering of the people here. What everybody's giving out of, out of what, what they make, out of what they work for, Lord. And, and I know that you, you bless that. I know that you can see what people do and that your spirit drives us to it. And so, Lord, I pray uh, as we continue to give, I pray that as we continue to serve, that your Holy Spirit will just move in us. Draw families unto you, draw people unto you. And I pray that you'll be with the rest of the service as we worship in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Y'all worship with us. are 
my cup and you make my lot secure the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places a beautiful inheritance in your presence there is your name this morning that you are our portion the lot that's been given to us in life Lord may is different for everyone but God you are our portion and you are the the blessing that we get as we seek you you reward us with yourself and Lord I pray as this church as we grow in our knowledge of you as we grow to that breadth the length the depth the height of who you are I pray that our lives will be geared more towards you. I pray that others may see that, and they may also come and worship you. I pray as we open your scripture, your Holy Spirit will speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said amen, and amen. Amen. You can have a seat right where you are. We're glad that you've joined us for worship. I want you to take your Bible and open it with me to Genesis chapter 50, to Genesis chapter 50. So good to worship with you and read God's Word with you. We are traveling through uh, Scripture together throughout the year. We're going to travel through the Scripture, and we're going to see the big story behind all the stories in Scripture. And uh, it's been my pleasure and my joy to be able to study the events of Genesis anew and afresh because it gives us a foundational level to begin with. And so we're going to talk about the life of Joseph. This morning, and we're going to learn a lot from Joseph, who was an Israeli Egyptian. Joseph is a great individual to study because he brings us to deeper knowledge of who God is. So we'll begin our reading in Genesis chapter 50, and we'll look at verse number 15, and we'll build from there. So Genesis 50, verse 15, if you're there, say amen. 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 Let's read the word together. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will hate us and will certainly requite us or reward us or punish us for all the evil which we did to him. So even before we get to the backdrop of this narrative, we know that there was some family conflict, right? There, there's some family animosity. There's There's some hurt feelings from past situations. So your family might have lived through something like this or going through something like this. Animosity can exist within families, even when families are together. So you see that the father has passed. Jacob is dead. We studied Jacob last week. And now it's just Joseph and his brethren and their families. They're saying now that dad's dead, he was the one that held us together. Certainly Joseph is going to come after us. We'll read a little further. So they sent a messenger unto Joseph, and they said, Thy father did command before, die, before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, all the trespasses or sins of your brethren, for they did unto you evil. And now we pray, Forgive the trespasses of the servants of your God, of your father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him, probably because of the way they projected onto him what he might do to them. Have you ever been around somebody and you're carrying on a conversation and maybe they gasp for a second, they go, (gasps) and you're like, what happened? Well, you you said, and they, they tell you what you said, they think you said something filthy. I've had people do that when I'm preaching, say, I think you said this while you were preaching. I'm like, I didn't say it while I was preaching. 
They said, I swear you let, it, you let it slip. I said, that's just telling me what you think about me, that I just go around swearing all the time and it slipped and fell out. I mean, think about it. We project things onto each other, don't we? And that, that can hurt your feelings. That can upset you as a person. You could say, I, I would never, what would make you think I want to kill you? You've been living under my care for this long. I brought you out of famine. I brought you out of a diseased place. I, I give you, I've given you favor with Pharaoh. I've, I've backed you up in everything. And now that dad is dead, you, you think that I'm going to hate you? Man, can you imagine Joseph's like, man, I've been through all this and my family still thinks I hate him. And Joseph never did anything ill toward his family. Yet that's how they perceived him. And that's what happens, right? You can perceive people the wrong way. You can project on them something that's not truth. So one thing I tell folks about in church life and in life in general, if you didn't hear it come from me, then it didn't come from me. It came from whoever said it. It didn't come from me. If you hear it from me, then yes, it came from me. You don't, you don't project on people what they haven't said to you. Don't try to read into their actions and their movements. Let, let those things speak for themselves and you'll have some peace. There won't be a whole bunch of gossip. gossip. There won't be a whole bunch of, of, uh, uh, of separation between you and people if you don't project on them what you think of them or what they might do to you based on how you're feeling. So Joseph, he, he wept. He wept. And, they, and as they spake unto him, and his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we, we're your servants. We're your slaves. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not. I'm in God's place. Let me say something. There is some confidence and some self-worth and value in knowing you're in the place of God. When you don't doubt where you're at, you're good to people. You're not, you're not, you're not after people because you're looking around and saying, this is God's place for me. I'm good with this. This is fine. I mean, how I got here was tough. My road was rough. My journey was bleak. It was, it was a mess from the start. But I'm standing where God destined me to stand. So I'm not finding my hope, my faith, my peace, or my comfort in you. I'm finding my faith, my hope, my peace, and my comfort in where God and his sovereignty has put me through my life's events. So I'm resting in God. I'm, I'm in the place of God. But he goes further. He said, I'm in the place of God, and I get it. You did think evil against me, but God meant it as good. Because evil is not greater than God. Evil events are not greater than God. God's greater than evil. God overcomes evil with good. And we know he does this because he tells us, not don't be overcome by evil or with evil, but overcome that which is evil with that which is good. Did you know throughout history, there's been oppressors, and there's been the oppressed. How many of y'all know that? Just studying history, logically, wars and, and groups merging and taking others over. This is what, how, how the world goes about this. When the oppressed are released and they're given power, they become the oppressor. Joseph is the per perfect picture of what the kingdom of God ought to be when those who are oppressed are released and given power, they're not the oppressor, they're the blesser. So you say, I've lived through oppression, and I, I've lived through abuse in my life, and hurt, and heartache, and somebody ruled over me with an iron fist, and they, they buckled down on me, and I don't feel like I was given a fair shake in my family, or at my workplace, or in my school, or in my society, in my culture. I, I feel like I was just belittled, but now God has elevated me. Be the blesser. Be the blesser. Because you're not in the place of God to be the oppressor. God did not bring you where you were and give you the little bit of power you got. He did not ordain that to crush people. He ordained that for you to lift each other up. And if each generation decides, I'm going to lift John up, and John says, I'm going to lift you up, and, and Raber says, I'm going to lift John up, and Mason says, I'm going to lift Raber up, you know what happens? We all are elevated together. So Joseph's a beautiful picture. And the reason I'm getting how beautiful Joseph's picture is of his life is because of this. Jacob, his father, was the height of moral depravity in the line of Abraham. He was a messed up uh, guy in his past. Now, thank God there was a change in his life. 
But when we study the story, if you read these like 14 chapters that are about Joseph and his family and his life, which is a, a large chunk uh, uh, of Genesis. I mean, matter of fact, Moses writes more about Joseph than anything else in Genesis. You'll discover when you're, when you're reading this, he gives Joseph his time because Jacob, Jacob's relieved of his, of, his, uh, 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 of his oppression. He's given his son. His son is overseeing his brethren and doing a good job at it, but he gives him a good portion of the time because Jacob was the height of the, the prey of the line of Abraham, the promised seed. And, and Joseph, he's at the top. He's at the top. And the cool thing about showing Joseph at the top, and even his brothers had a change of heart. After they sold him into slavery, we'll get into all that. He come, they go into Egypt, where Joseph is at. They don't know he's been raised to a kingship level. So they go into Egypt, and uh, Joseph just says, do you have a brother? Well, yeah, I've, we've got brothers. They don't know it's him. He's speaking to them in Egyptian tongue, and he don't look the same. Everything's different. He said, do you have a father? Yes, we have a father and brother. He goes, well, I think you're spies. So until you go and bring me your brother and bring report back to your father, I think you're lying because his brothers were liars. So he goes back, and Jacob's age now, Scott, right? I mean, he's done got older, but you know what? Those old ways are still in him. <laughs> he says, I can't believe you told the man the truth. Jacob was such a conniver, it was rooted in him. He goes, why'd you even tell him you have a father or a brother? Now you're going to bereave me of my only child I would have left. I mean, oh, y'all might have got killed in Egypt, but at least I would have had Benjamin. Come on, guys, why did you tell the truth? And they just said, well, the man asked us straightly, do we have a brother and a father? And we just told him yes, but Jacob was a little upset because he was a, he was a liar. So Jacob was the height of this moral depravity it seemed like in in abraham's line at this time and then joseph's the height of the good moral character of abraham's line so he said you meant for evil god meant for good and he's going to do what he did and he has done what he did to save many people alive so we see salvation now therefore don't fear me i i will nourish you i like this and i'll take care of your children it is great and it's a special friendship when other adults say, I'm going to take care of you the best I can, but I'll make sure your children survive as well. When you're dead and gone, I'm going to make sure there's things set up where your children make it. Special relationship carried forth in, through Jacob into his sons. He said, I'm going to nourish you. And so they dwelt in, in Egypt. He and his father's house, Joseph, lived 110 years, and Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, he saw his gener generations grow. The children also of, of, of Machir, the son of Manesh, which were brought up upon G uh, Joseph's knees. And Joseph said unto his brethren, now I die. And God will surely, now this is important, so pay attention. And God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto which he swore unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel. That means they, they wrote this in stone. It was a legality, if you will. God will surely visit you and, carry, and you will carry my bones up out of this land. So Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Now, we're going to find out throughout the, the biblical history that Joseph's bones didn't stay there. So why would you want your bones moved? That's a good question, and we're going to try to answer some of those. Father, give us insight into your word. Give us insight into who you are, and bless us greatly for the knowledge that you're going to impart to us through your word. Be with each person, each family that's represented here. May you meet their needs through the preaching and teaching of your word. May we honor it, respect it. May we not take it lightly. May we not take each other's presence here lightly. May we not take worship together lightly, but may we embrace it. And let it nourish us up into the men and the women and the people we can be before the Lord in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. So I'm going to give you a brief history and rundown of, of, of Joseph. That way we know about Joseph, this is Israeli Egyptian. So Joseph was born to Jacob and Rachel in the land of Haran. Now if you remember, that's where Laban was. And if you don't know about that story, you need to go back in Genesis to where Jacob was on the run from Esau. But, jo but Joseph was born in a foreign land. He was, the, his, he was uh, with his mother as his father wrestled 
with the divine warrior from last week. He met his uncle Esau at a young age, and he grew up with his brothers in the land of Canaan. He is the favorite, or was the favorite of his father, due in large part to his excellence and character and his ability. Jacob just didn't select Joseph because, ooh, I like you. He saw something in Joseph that was pretty easy for normal people to see, and that was he was a pretty awesome kid that could handle responsibility. He was a pretty awesome kid that had good, upstanding moral character. So he was placed, although not the oldest, he was placed over his brothers, hence the coat of many colors signifying leadership in the home. So his brothers rejected this oversight in part because they saw how Joseph saw himself. That's, that's very important. Joseph saw himself through God-given dreams. And what he saw in his dreams was he was destined to be a ruler. He was destined to reign over his family, to guide his family, to be the protector of his family. And boy, did that make his brothers mad. Because you got to understand, the family's already split between two moms as it is. Same father, two different mothers. So there already is some conflict of interest, uh, interest there from Jacob's marriages. So there are already some things going on. And then Joseph shows up, sits down at the breakfast table and goes, how's, everybody's, how's everybody been doing? Been doing great. Everybody's, everything's great, Joseph. Thanks for asking. He says, let me tell you what I dreamed last night. And he lays out this dream that shows his, his rulership. And basically saying, God's chosen me over all you to see my family through life. But even his father said, what, what are you talking I'm the father, you're the son, but Jacob wasn't ignorant. He's like, God spoke to me before, so he might be speaking to my boy. And so he, he, he kept him in his mind. But he still rebuked him because he didn't want his brothers all upset. But his brothers didn't like him. So they decided, what else to do with a brother you don't like besides fake his death and sell him into slavery? Not natural at all, is it? Some deep hate. Hatred like you see that we saw between Cain and Abel. So they faked his death, they sold him into slavery, he ends up in the, uh, the land of Egypt, in the kingdom of Egypt, in the country of Egypt, and he becomes a slave to the captain of the guard of Egypt. Now meanwhile, while all this is going on, there's grief and trouble back home as Judah has a wild family situation, endangering the promise of the seed which was promised to Abraham and his descendants. So while there was trouble in Canaan, Joseph settled into his role as the leading slave in Potiphar's household. So here is a good-looking young man in Potiphar's household that is well-trusted. He looks good. He's self-controlled. He has great managing skills. So he catches the eye of Potiphar's wife who attempts to seduce him. And he does something that a young man would be very hard for a young man, alienated from home, alienated from any affection of family he tells the woman no over and over and over and over and over he refuses to be seduced so after the seduction didn't work a situation arose where Potiphar's wife falsely accused Joseph of sexual assault and so jo Joseph ends up in jail for two years he's not getting it easy he's in a bad situation in jail he meets two people the butler and the baker Evidently, there was something that happened between the butler and baker that made Pharaoh think they're trying to kill me. Because back then, t test tasting food and checking to make sure you're not being poisoned and, and whoever bore the cup, the wine to the, to the emperor or the Pharaoh, they had to make sure everything was legit. So something came up. Maybe Pharaoh thought there was a conspiracy on his life. I don't know exactly. But the butler and baker land up in jail and they have troublesome dreams. Well, Joseph has a gift and he puts his gift to work and he says, I'll help you out. Tell me what's going on. So they told him the dream. And he says, well, here's what's going to happen. You are going to get out of here in three days. Sounded good. You, on the other hand, you're going to get your head cut off in three days. Now, what I respect about Joseph is he didn't water down what the truth was. To look at any other human being and says, you're going to die in three days. And it came to pass. So as it came to pass... What they decided was, hey, don't worry about it. I'm going to remember you, and I'm going to tell Pharaoh all about your ability, and we're going to get you out of jail. Well, that didn't happen. They forgot about him. They forgot all about him. 
for a couple years. Well, a couple years passed, Pharaoh started having crazy dreams. And so it dawns on the guy, hey, I can go, I can go talk to, to, to Joseph. Look, y'all, I forgot all about him. I think that the guy was just getting back in good in the palace, and he didn't want to ruffle no feathers, so he just left Joseph in the jail is what I think. But anyway, he says, all right, we got this guy named Joseph. He's in the prison, but he can tell you about your dreams. Pharaoh says, go get him. So he goes, gets him, and, and Joseph said, hey, this is, I got this under control. God's going to interpret this for you. He's going to tell you all about it. He said, there's going to be seven years that there's going to be plenty. You need to store up. Because that plenty is going to run out. You need to save up. You need to have a strategy. And you're going to have seven years of famine. And these seven years of famine are going to be terrible. And you're going to need to have corn saved and wheat saved. And you're going to make sure that we are planning for this seven. Don't spoil the years of plenty. That could be a great lesson for all of us. If you're in a time of plenty in your life, don't squander it. Because famine always seems to like to come. Trouble likes to come. Financial pain, difficulty likes to come. You don't get to ride the high forever. So make sure you're smart and don't squander. So Pharaoh said, I like this guy. He's right. He's good. And so he placed him second in command. And so now we have this Israeli slave has really become an Egyptian. He is taken on, he's in his, a promised seed of Abraham, but also an Egyptian. Now, one similarity between Joseph and Jesus is Jesus, completely God, the complete promised seed of Abraham, completely man. That, that's kind of cool if you watch the typology that unfolds in Jacob's life. So meanwhile, back in Canaan, as Joseph's saving Egypt and giving them great advice, meanwhile, back in Canaan, the famine's taking hold, they're starving their supplies have run out. And so Jacob sends his sons into Egypt and says, go buy food and bring us back food. Now, here's something I want you to ponder on and speculate with me. What would have happened if the family of Israel respected Joseph? Egypt would be coming to Israel to buy corn. It would have swung everything. So don't be jealous and don't hate. Don't discriminate against people that are gifted, that have insight, that have leadership ability, that maybe be well-liked in their community, their culture, their grouping. Don't, don't hate. Don't, don't look down because that might be the ticket for the whole group to be lifted up. Now, we don't know what would have happened if they would have respected Joseph, but we're pretty sure that God would have preserved his people, and most likely Egypt and the rest of the world would have been coming to Israel for help and not going to Egypt. So what unfolds next is a bright spot in the history of God's chosen people, the short history. Joseph conducts himself, and we can see the promise of God to Abraham temporally fulfilled in Joseph. That's why Moses spends so much time writing on him. We can see this great promise of Abraham that he would have kings from his genealogy, that much, they would have much land and prosperity. You could see it temporarily filled in Joseph, just a, little, just a little bit. You could see that God was going to do what he said he was going to do because from Abraham to Joseph isn't a long history, and all of a sudden a small group of nomadic people have elevated, that one of their people have elevated to being a hierarchy in the Egyptian state. So we begin to see great things unfold as Joseph investigates, forgives, provides, and in the end exalts the sovereignty and promises of God over his people. So that's where we are. That's, that's the update. But now I want to bring you to a, a truth we see, a biblical truth that really begins to flow from Joseph that I want you to get. And I call this, I'm just going to call this the one theology, one <laughs> The one theology. So God's word is working through the book of Genesis to bring us to the one. In Genesis, the one is Joseph. But that is just a small snapshot of the one to come. The seed of the woman, one, promised in Genesis 3.15. And the seed of Abraham, promised to Abraham, the one, who would eventually become the son of God, which would be Jesus. So we're seeing this one theology start breaking down. So 
This is pushing us toward the one that's promised, the one to be king, the one that will redeem, the one that we are to worship. At this point, we have a simple glimpse of God's, of God's sovereignty running down through the historical narrative of Genesis. Now, so we're going to break this down. Let's go to this one, this one idea that we get about God's plan to redeem his people. You have Adam and Eve. He made Adam and Eve. How many of y'all remember that account we talked about? Pretty, pretty simple. Adam and Eve had two children, Cain and Abel. Out of that, God said, I appreciate, and I'm honoring and accepting Abel, he's one, sacrifice. That don't go over well, Cain kills Abel. So Cain's exiled, but then Seth is born. Even though Cain could have been the, the, the lineage of the promised seed, God chose Seth. Time moves on. Here comes a multitude of people, the population of the known earth. They roll through. They're all fixing to be judged and condemned. God chooses one, Noah, along with his family. Flood happens. Recreation, if you will, happens. And here we go. The repopulation of the earth starts churning on down. We have the incidents of all the nations being at Babylon, of all the people being there at the Tower of Babel. And God disinherits every nation, every person. He disinherits them. He says, that's, that's it. I'm disinheriting and throwing y'all out. Go inhabit the earth the way you design. And in the midst of that, as history is marching on, God chose one, Abraham. Abraham has two children, Ishmael and Isaac. And he tells Abraham, it's in Isaac, the one, that your seed shall be established. Isaac goes on, he has Jacob and Esau. He says, Jacob have I loved. God says, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. Before they were even born, God had selected that I'm going to use one, using Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. He says, I'm going to use one. And that's how God works. If you'll follow out the biblical history, God works through that one ideology. You have Saul, which was chosen to be one king. Then David was chosen to be the king. During the book of Judges, God would raise up a judge. He was always moving through this one ideology. Although there was many, he was picking one. Now here's something where we fail in biblical interpretation is if God elects one, then he, adrect, he rejects all. That's usually what we think. If God elects so-and-so, then that must mean he rejects all these people. But that's completely wrong according to this one ideology because Paul says it this way. Let me just tell you what the Bible says. Paul sums up this one ideology like this. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For through the offense of one, many may be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So the election of one is not the rejection of the multitude, but the salvation of the multitude. The election of Joseph was not the condemnation of Israel, but was the salvation of Israel. So sometimes when we begin to look at election in biblical doctrine, we start thinking, well, God's just simply unfair. No, you haven't grasped the massive plan of God and his electing power to save the multitude. So although that we see this ideology of one unfold and we see God's plan unfolding through Joseph in this one ideology to save his brethren, it's not... Although he is the one of Genesis, he's not the one. We see a lot of small redemptive stories in the Bible before we come to the main redemptive story. But Joseph is a picture of a redeemer. His life reveals one of leadership, temptation, suffering, rejection, false accusation, and false condemnation. Same with the life of Jesus. But his life also exhibits forgiveness, ruling, and salvation. Israel was saved through him, yet the salvation was simply physical and temporal another cool thing about jacob or joseph here is that joseph marries an egyptian woman he marries an african woman he is an israelite who is marrying a gentile it's pretty cool 
Matter of fact, they have children. And the children carry on his tribal heritage. Manish and Ephraim. They get to inherit land because Levi won't get to inherit in the land because he's a priest office, which means his inheritance is of the Lord. Second, Joseph was replaced by Manesh and Ephraim. So they get to inherit the land. And they get to experience the life of an Israeli, although we have an Israelite marrying a Gentile person. But the cool thing is Jesus' bride is Gentile. His church is made up of mostly Gentile people, not Jewish people. And from us, our witness to others, we're bringing in more like us. So we get to experience the heritage of Abraham, although we're not of the tribe of Abraham. And thus, through Joseph, all the nations of the earth are being blessed. If you can handle that much information at one time, God is blessing the nations. Not only is he saving the nations and blessing them while Joseph's in Israel, he's all of a sudden starting to bring in all the nations through this marriage and through the timeline that would unfold from there as we're all brought in by, by faith in Jesus to the heirs of Abraham. How many of y'all with me so far say amen? Isn't the story of Joseph just wonderful? I mean, it's a lot to it, 14 chapters. You're not simply going to get it by listening to me preach. You have to go read it. That's the thing about your Bible. Personal discipleship is personal. You got to read it. You got to listen to it. You've got to study it. You, when you don't understand it, just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep a rolling. Some of it's ancient. Some of it's hard. Some of it, some of it you ain't going to get. Some of it I ain't going to get. But that don't mean we don't put, that don't mean we lay it down. Just keep rolling. Keep having faith. And God will help you through understanding uh, his word. So my big question was this. This will be what we'll do for the rest of the time. What do we learn about God through the life of Joseph? Because I said in the scriptures, we're going to meet individuals. But the primary cause of meeting individuals is not to get to know that individual, but to get to know God through that individual. To get to know how God works and operates and what his plan is and how powerful he is and how loving he is, how caring he is. He is a God of justice. He is a God of, uh, of, of mercy. He is a God of righteousness. He is a God of equality. And we're going to see all that lay out through the people we meet in Scripture. So what do we learn about God through the life of Joseph? Number one, God works against all odds. Now hear me on this. God's working against all the odds in your life as he worked against all the odds in Joseph's life to fulfill his promises. God has made promises and he will keep his promises against all odds. He told Abraham, you're going to have a great nation and from you will come the seed that will redeem all nations and bless all nations. I promise you this is going to happen. But when he promised Abraham that, he also promised him there would be years of suffering and there would be years of trials and there would be years of heartaches, but none of that is going to push my promises from you. Matter of fact, it will be those things that will pull my promises to you the same goes for you God will work on your behalf to fulfill his promise to you if you're a Christian if you're born again and you believe in Jesus Christ God's promises to you are yea and amen your resurrection is as sure as you are seated here that means when you die you will rise again that means when you die you will enter a heavenly realm where God and the saints and the heavenly host do abide until the resurrection the promises for you are true and they're not fading they're not faltering they cannot be withheld God cannot be stopped because there ain't nobody like our God God works against all odds so you look at the odds facing you as a believer and you tell those odds they are not your God you will not bend to them you will not bow to them you will not succumb to them you'll work through them you'll work until God works on your behalf God will work, and against all odds, he'll fulfill his promise. And he teaches us this through Joseph's life. Because everything that could happen wrong in the family of Israel happened wrong. There was family hatred, like we see in the life of Cain and Abel. That spirit reemerges to attack the family unit. 
But God still keeps his promises even when his brothers were after doing mean and evil, hateful things to him. God was just stirring their hate into a future. So family issues arose. And then there was purity issues within the family. I'm not going to get into Judah's situation, but Judah was of the seed of Abraham, and he had a mess of a situation going on during the time his brother was in Egypt. And that messy unrighteousness and his messy sex life and his, his messy marriages and just messing it all up, it didn't ruin God's plan. Now, it could have. And if left up to me and you, it should have. But God knows how to take man's worst mistakes and move them around to move in a direction that glorifies God. Number three, there was a famine that threatened the entire family of the promised seed that could have wiped the whole family out. And that's not even to mention Joseph's issues in Egypt. He called it the land of his affliction. When he named his son, he said, I'm naming my son Manesh. I'm naming my son Ephraim. One means you have caused me to forget the affliction that I've had in this land. His children, God moving him and blessing him. He said, you, my child has caused me to see the affliction in this land differently. See, God will cause you to see your situation different if you'll trust him. He said, I'm seeing things different. He had another child, and he said, I, I'm going to name this child the one who has caused me to forget all the grief from my father's house. Which tells me Joseph was a man of sorrow and grief. Reminds me of Isaiah 53 where it says, Jesus was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. But Joseph said, even in the midst of everything, God has fulfilled his promise. He has been to me my God. Now I can tell you the complexities here of Joseph's marriage and married life. He married a priest's daughter. Not a godly priest's daughter. But he married a daughter whose daddy was a priest to a false god. And all Joseph knew was Yahweh, the creator. But you don't read of them duking it out. God don't go through and give us a lot of marriage counsel about this situation. It appears, the best we can tell, that they fulfilled their married obligations one to another and probably cared about each other. Joseph was certainly a family man. So we could get into all that. The point is God was still preserving Joseph through all of it. So we learned that God will keep promises against all odds. Number two. God blesses those who live according to his design. How was Joseph blessed? Number one, he was favored by his father. He was favored by his father. God blesses those who live according to his design and live by his nature. So Joseph found favor with his father. He did not find favor with his brothers, but with his father he did. When he was sold into slavery, he went to Potiphar's house. And soon, what did he find? Favor. Why? Because he acted with upstanding moral character even when daddy wasn't looking. When mama couldn't look and grandmama couldn't look and granddaddy couldn't look, Joseph still lived according to his giftings and according to what he knew about God. That should teach us something about growing up as God's people. It's not about who's looking that you like. It's about God looking all the time that you love. Right? God's eyes always on you and he's watching you. Favor by his father and then he got favor by Potiphar. Now that favor, each time it seems like favor leads to issues. It appears that because he was favored by his father, his brethren hated him. That's true. He was favored by Potiphar. So his wife wanted him, not his wife, but Potiphar's wife, looked at him and said, I want you. And that becomes a temptation. So that favor left, led to temptation. And let me say again, 
when you are put in a position where you have privilege or power or ability or influence or however you like to call it, there is the temptation to do wrong with it. But do like Joseph did and said, how can I sin against Potiphar, my neighbor, and how can I sin against God? He found favor also in prison. They put him in prison, and even the chief of the prison said, this dude's awesome. I'm going to let you take care of everything to do with the prisoners. Make sure they get the meals they need. Make sure everything runs smooth. Make sure they get along, solve all the conflict. And it made the, the prison guard's life easy. He found favor in prison. And finally, he found favor with Pharaoh. He just kept living, kept living, kept living, kept. Now think about this. He could have got mad at Egypt and mad at their system and mad at everything going on. He could have cussed you. He was blue in the face. He could have told everybody in prison, they forgot me. They left me down here. I'm gifted. I was a leader in my father's house. They don't know my lineage. They don't know the promise of my God. All these people are crazy. He could have went on and went on a rant and a tirade, but even alone in the dark in the prison cell, he still lived godly. And guess what? Favor came knocking. Live as God's design. Because he blesses those that live according to his design. Number three, God moves history. Joseph's life is a life and a story of transition. Transition not ask for. Joseph did not ask to be transitioned from leader of his father's house to a slave. He didn't ask for that transition. He was given that transition. God moves history. He didn't ask to be transitioned from a leader in Potiphar's house to a poor prisoner, maybe awaiting execution in Pharaoh's dungeon. He didn't ask for that transition. He was given that transition. And certainly in your life, you are given transitions you have no control over. Now, you can do one or two things. You can try to be the God of your transition, which you aren't. You didn't initiate it. You won't complete it. Paul said, I am confident of this very thing, that he that began this work in me, he will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. There's confidence in knowing that God is the God of your transition. He is the God of your salvation. If you've been saved and you've been transformed by the renewing of your mind, do not pat yourself on the back. Don't look up and tell everybody how great you've been at church attendance and that's why you got saved. You better look at the God of heaven and say I was a lowly sinner and you transitioned my life and you transformed my life. You're the God of my life and I will worship you with my life because he moves history, including your personal history. Some of y'all are in marriages you didn't plan to be in because your first one didn't work out. She ran out. He walked out. Somebody died. Horrific things happened. You didn't, you didn't plan that transition. But you're in, a new, you're in a new life. You're in a new area of your life where you can honor and glorify God. You haven't lost value. You haven't surprised God. Some of you would live in another state, but something brought you here. Your transition was God moved and God breathed. You wouldn't have the job you have. You would, you, if it was up to you, you'd be running that last business or be employed by that last place. But you got transition. You say, I got, I got fired. I remember going to Bible college. I went to school with some crazy people. I'm almost, some of y'all have told, I've told intimate and personal stories too, but most of you haven't. I, I went to school with some crazy people. I imagined that they were normal. Have y'all ever been around people and imagined that they were normal? Yeah, that's how Shannon feels about me. But you imagine, yeah, that's very true. If you, if you imagine I'm normal, you're crazy. But, you know, they, they imagined, I imagined that they were normal. And I, I met this guy, and he had a great job, Ryan. I mean, he just had a great job. And I talked to him. He was just a nice, seemed to be a normal guy. And Steve, I'd talk to him, walk up to college, walk up that little area, go to the college room, and I'd be there a few minutes early because I, I despised being late. Despised being late. I was carrying a friend up, and I was showing up to Dr. Brown's 
class on homiletics and hermeneutics, and he was teaching. It was a Thursday evening, and because I'm trying to get people to go to church with me, I was being righteous, and I, I was late. And Preacher Brown's sitting there, and he's reading his outline, and we walk in that door, and he goes, Hey, y'all boys got a clock? Y'all know what time we start, huh? Sit down. That was it. But anyway, this guy, he looked at me. He said, I said, how's it going, man? I was just, I was envious of his job. I mean, he was making bank. I'm sitting here working for Adam for $3.25 an hour. I'm like, dude, I'm dying here. I, I'm out there working, Bo. I'm working hard. I ain't getting nothing. I ain't getting nothing. But I get my retirement because I go up there and steal pine straw all I can. But <laughs> so I'm like, man, this guy's, he's got, he got it going on. He's, he was working for Pepsi or somebody. I'm like, dude. So I'm like, man, how's everything going? How's work? He goes, it's great. I got a promotion. And now I really hated him. I'm like, you got, you got a promotion? Dude, that is awesome. That's great. So what are you doing? Hey, I got fired. Did anybody call getting fired a promotion? This guy looked at it that way. He said, oh, God's just in the transitioning mode. He just, he's just transitioning me. He wants me to do ministry. He, he wants me to serve him full time, and I guess the only way to get my attention was to fire me from that good job. So I'm just going to be serving God from now on. I'm thinking, how are you going to eat? <laughs> but he saw things differently. He saw God moving in a, different, in a different way. You may be sitting in a transition you didn't ask for. Just go ahead and admit you didn't make it happen. You're not, you're not the God of it. I'm not saying dodge responsibility. I'm saying re recognize sovereignty. God moves through history to make things happen for his glory. And everything that happened to Joseph foreshadowed God's promised fulfillment to Abraham. And finally, this is good. God gives us faith in death of a better tomorrow. Look at Hebrews eleven twenty two. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel, and he gave commandment concerning his bones. What was his command? Don't leave my bones here because God's coming to get you out of this place. Now, if I'm the brethren, and I'm the nieces and I'm the nephews, I'm like, we, we kind of, we got, they gave us our own spot here. This is a place where there's food and leadership. It already has structure. I'm going to plant my feet here. Joseph is co-regent. He is, he is high up as Pharaoh is. And he said, this ain't, this ain't, as, this ain't the top. What do you mean this ain't the top? Get my bones out of here because God's going to deliver you just like he told Abraham because they talked about Abraham's promise. And Abraham told him they was going to be slaves in a foreign land. So Joseph knew what was coming down the line, but he saw past the affliction. He said, now get my bones out of here, past the slavery, past the bondage. I don't know how God or when God's going to do it, but he said he's going to do it. And take me to the promised land and put my bones there. But why put my bones there? Because Joseph believed in resurrection. He saw what Abraham saw. Now, Jacob didn't see it completely like that. Neither did the brethren. Esau certainly didn't see it. But Abraham saw the day and rejoiced in the day and believed in resurrection. He was the first one to bring up that idea. If God's going to make me sacrifice Isaac here, then he must gonna be going to raise him from the dead because we're coming back down this mountain together. So we already had that idea, and this idea went on to Joseph, and Joseph said, when I am resurrected, I want my resurrected feet to be standing in that promised land. That is the Israeli Egyptian. He said, this ain't my home. I want to be resurrected, and I want my new body to stand on that promised land. Now, I don't know where you're at or how far your mind goes, but generally, our mind goes as far as death allows it to go. Basically, everything we do in everyday life is because death is coming. That's generally how we live. You don't even know it. It's so second nature to us to 
do what we do so we don't die. We work so we don't die. We make sure we have a home that's stable so we don't die or freeze to death in storms. We take care of our children so when we do die, we have something that lives past us. I mean, if you really think about it, most everything we do is because we're going to die. Now, if that's far as you can see, I get that. understand that because that's our first nature is to think, man, you know, we're, we're going to die. But Joseph did not live like he lived because he was going to die. Joseph lived like he lived because he knew he was going to live. There's a big difference. So do you believe in the resurrection of the dead? You believe, if you say, well, no, I don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, that sounds kind of crazy. You can't believe in Jesus Christ. Because the foundation of our belief and our worship and our songs and our teaching are on the fact that he rose bodily from the grave. If you can sit there and say, well, yes, I do believe in the resurrection, then you're one of us. Believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's the first fruit of the dead. Then if you really believe that, let the implications of that sink in for a minute. I sat down with Jenna, my cousin, before she passed with cancer. She asked us to come over. Me and Tara went over to Brother Brett, Miss Becky's home. He, he pastors over in Aiken now. And I sit down and she goes, I just don't know what it's going to be like. 14 years old. I just don't, I don't know what it's going to be like. And right there in the yard is a big oak by the lake. And I looked at her and said, since what Jesus did for us is real and sure, that means me and you, our feet, are going to touch this ground together again. And we're going to stand under that oak. One day in eternity, our feet are going to touch this recreated earth. It means, you know, this ain't it. I'm going to have to tell you goodbye here, but it's not permanent. It means because what Jesus did, we got a future not yet seen. Now, what does that do? That makes grief that's coming at you not retreat, but stop. I got two dogs at home. One's 80 pounds, one's 180 pounds. These dogs get excited. They'll come running right down my hallway, and I can look at them and say, Hey! And they slide. And their butt hits the floor. Left unattended, they had run right over me like big old buffalo. You know what the resurrection does to grief as it's running at you and it's getting ready to tear you up and floor you and smash you? You could say, Hey, I'm going to see them. They're going to see me. I'm going to see the saints. Think this ain't going to stay like this. It's like this, but it's not going to stay like this. My bones will be taken out of this place. I'm going to be resurrected. And it ain't going to be the same. It's going to be better. Stand to your feet. Let me give you a C.S. Lewis illustration. If you, have, if you have kids in the room, don't bring them here. Um, I'm joking. Bring your kids. We want to be real with them. C.S. Lewis trying to wrap his mind around how great heaven was. He, he said this. He said, as, and Todd said, oh, <laughs> Todd knows where I'm going. He said, as a, he said if, you, if you take a five-year-old and you ask your five-year-old, would you, would you rather experience sex or chocolate? The five-year-old would shake his head at one and say, give me chocolate, because they have no idea what the other is. There's no experience. Now, for married men in here, if you offered sex or chocolate you know the experience it's something higher more intimate more embracing and more fulfilling you say man you talk about that pretty plain well so does scripture so get off my back yo I got this hey look how God created us and made us should not be something we sweep under the rug and let our school system mess with we should be able to talk about it like people that understand it. The point is, there's some things that we're still saying, give me chocolate because we don't know the depth of a relationship. I just want chocolate. If you were to say, man, would you love to have your loved one sitting next to you? You would say, yes. That's because you want chocolate. There's something better that you haven't yet experienced. There's something greater more beautiful, more bonding, 
more knitting together than you ever could imagine. So that's how C.S. Lewis looked at it. I didn't understand as a boy deep relationship. All I understood was sweets. But better than sweets, there's something sweeter. And as children of the faith, oftentimes all we understand are the sweets part, sweet parts of the faith. The chocolates of the faith. Tell me that everything's going to be okay. Tell me grandma's going to get healed of this sickness. Tell me daddy ain't going to die. Tell me, tell me that I'm not going to lose my job. Tell, tell me that the stock market ain't going to plummet. Tell me that a fire is not going to ravage my home. Tell me, tell me. Just tell me lies. Tell, tell me something to give me hope. Tell me, tell me something. Just lift me up, preacher. Pump me up. So when I leave out of here, I'm pumped up and I'm juiced up. I don't want to simply hand you out chocolates. I want to tell you when the storm comes, there's a God that can get you to the other side. But the storm's coming. I want to tell you that you have the ability to walk on water. And you have the ability to sink. So hold fast to Jesus. I want to tell you there's a sure and steady anchor for your life. I want to tell you when you say goodbye to your loved one that they will resurrect if they believe in Jesus Christ. And they will rule and reign on a renewed earth where the fallen nations, the disinherited nations have been wiped out. And there's only one king and there's only one kingdom. I want you to have that which is sweeter. Because nobody in here grows into men and women eating chocolate morning, noon, and night. If you believe in the power of our Lord and the promises given to Abraham that's been fulfilled in Jesus Christ, give the Lord a hand clap of praise in God's house. Now we're going to pray and we're going to sing. If you need prayer for anything, in your life that may be unique Miss Debbie's right here and she will pray with you and she will pray for you and she, she will help you in any way uh, that, that she's able to do that. Brother Ryan's coming up with me here. He's not going to play anything. He's not going to sing. But he'll be right here. If you need prayer as a man a gentleman and you have a specific prayer request, Brother Ryan's going to pray with you. He's a deacon of our church. He's a good man, and he will pray with you. Don't look for elaborate, spellbound prayers. Just look for somebody to agree. God, help them where they are. In Jesus' name. Let's pray. Let's sing. Let's worship. God's love displayed you so 
shepherd in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me. Now all I know is grace. Hallelujah. strength to follow your commands could never come from me. Oh, Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose and let my song forever Father, what a God you are. Now, as we sing and we digest the words to such a true, powerful song, may we agree that what we have is you, and you are all we need. For from you do all our blessings flow. And from you is all our ability to be obedient to your commands. It is from you that we are held together, that we are kept together. You are everything. You are the Lord God. And beside you, there is no other. Help us prize you in our living. Help us prize you in our obedience. Help us prize you in our self-discipline. Help us prize you in the way we treat our neighbors, our closest neighbors, our wives, our husbands, our children. Help us prize and obey you. And may we go from this place, Lord, believing stronger in your truth and seeing more of your history unfold before our eyes. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. And Amen. If you're glad you came and worship with us, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Here at Bethany, we're all about next steps. If you are a new believer in Jesus and you want to follow through with baptism, we want to help you with that. Immediately following service, you can speak to our worship pastor, Brother Todd, and talk with him and let him know you're interested in that next step. He can help you with that and be glad to. If you are a guest, thank you for being here. I have a small gift to give you in the foyer, and me and my wife would love to get to meet you briefly. So our guests can exit through our foyer. If you're with us all the time, if you don't mind exiting through the double doors here, 
to give us some time with our guests and uh, some folks that are new here. And if you are picking up children back here with Brother Steve is by the sound room, just pick them up and exit this way. Thank you all for being here, and we'll see you at 5 p.m. tonight as we study God's Word further.